going through some expectations of, of working in the engineering sector. Compared to the actual reality, So there's a vast difference between what people think our most important assets are compared to what we learn at university and what we actually display to the community. This will also go through some of our key skills that we need to have as a structural engineer. So let's get into busting some of these myths. Need to study tonight. Mm. Yeah, guys, it's not nearly as bad as this. But you do not stop studying after you leave university. You see, once you've graduated university, you only really scratch the surface of what you need to know as a structural engineer. You only really cover the preliminary skills to know how to design a building. You see, people spend many years to find out the fundamental aspects of how a concrete structure actually works. So how to design a PT structure, how to design an RC structure. You can see how long people actually take to learn these aspects to even get a PhD. And even when we're looking at structures, there's many different materials that you can use. You can have timber design, you can have composite design, and composite design has time-dependent behavior that you need to consider. So you can see there's a big breadth of knowledge that you need to encompass. And even communication skills, you're only being taught how to write technical papers, not necessarily how you should be professionally sending out emails, how you should be writing for different audiences, as you're not writing to your professor or someone that has those key skills that you have. So if you're enjoying this video about expectations versus reality as a structural engineer, please exceed my expectations by smashing that like button. It gives me a smile on my face and helps me keep doing this content for you. Hi John, I see that you've actually signed me a work task. I haven't actually done something like this before. Do you mind me spending a bit of time and learning on the job? Thanks for letting me know, Brendan. I'm sure I can help you out here. So I've got a lot of materials that I can send to you. They actually help, help you so you can actually read it during work hours. Spend as much time as you need to get familiar with the type of design that we're doing. Hi John, I see that you've actually signed me a work task. I haven't actually done something like this before. Do you mind me spending a bit of time and learning on the job? Thanks for letting me know, Brendan. Now, this is really something that you should be doing at this stage. So look, I will send you some materials and we can look at some seminars to send you to, but you will need to do a lot of work after hours to catch up. The project budgets are quite tight, so we don't have a lot of time if you do a lot of on-job learning. And while maintaining the skills, you don't necessarily have the time in the office to keep up the learning. Yes, they will have some technical development inside your office, but you need to make sure you're maintaining and exceeding the knowledge that they're actually giving you, as you do not have time to learn on the job. So if you've got a new design that you haven't seen before, so going through those external seminars, making sure you're maintaining what knowledge you have and what knowledge you do not have. It's not beholden on work to make sure that you're constantly developing those skills and making sure that you're on the right trajectory. As the office, it does help them to some extent to make sure they have safe designs. So that's why they have some technical aspect, but there's also a benefit there to you as well. As the better the engineer you are, the more you improve your skills, the more sellable in the market you're going to be and the more likely you, you are to get a pay rise. So there's benefits to you and there's also benefits to the company. So it's making sure that finding the areas that you do not know, taking the code home and potentially reading it, reading external papers, watching YouTube videos like this, and hopefully um, helping improve your knowledge as well. But there's many ways that you can help and make sure you're exceeding and improving your engineering knowledge over time. Here's the drawings. Here's the computations. If you can just check this and get back to me. So 
So Brendan, I've checked all your work and I've just found a couple of errors in some of the computations, if you can update them. And if we're looking through the drawings, I can see that we've got some critical areas here that we need to check, so you can just get onto that. Here's the drawings, here's the computations, if you can just check this and get back to me. So Brendan, I've just had a quick flick through. I haven't really checked the comps, so I'm sure you know what you're doing. Let's just get it out. Now, checking of work. Yes, a lot of companies, they mostly have QA procedures to make sure that your work is maintained and effectively checked. However, you should not be reliant upon this. So you should be making sure you're double or triple checking to make sure there's no errors in your design. So the ability of the checker, they do not have the history that you've had with that project. They do not have the time to check every single line in your design. So making sure that you've double checked, you've triple checked everything. They're looking at the general aspects of the design, looking for any patterns they may see in there. Does it look like they're expecting? Now, most of the time they will be able to pick up where those errors are, but it's not something you should be reliant upon. They do not necessarily have the time to make sure they've checked every single spot. And if there's any critical spots that you're concerned about as well, is maybe flagging it to them. These are some critical spots that I'm a little bit worried about. And could you look at it in a little bit more detail? But this is not something that you should be reliant upon. You should be giving something to them and hopefully they pick up nothing in your design. That is really what you're trying to aim for. So you need to make sure that you've maintained every aspect to that design that you possibly can to make sure there is no errors. And it's much like proofreading as well. They're there to see if there's any aspects that you may have missed. As quite often you're looking at the drawings, you may miss a key element in that design. And that's really what they're there for. When they're finding errors in your designs, this is something that you should actually take as a good thing as well. Yes, you do not want to have any errors, however, it's a way that you can help improve your knowledge. So what have you missed? And make sure you do not miss it in future projects. G'day guys, my name is Bill, I'm the lead architect on this project. I'm just gonna go through some of the key aspects that you've done with your current design and where we're currently sitting. So Brendan, let's kick it off. Oh, hi Bill, yeah, well, I'm the structural engineer on the project, so I've been doing some numbers and I've been finding some of the shear forces and stresses are getting a bit high. So it means we need quite heavy leaks and congestion in some areas. Also the column stresses are beyond allowable limits, so that, now, now, now look, I'm going to stop you there because I don't really know what you're talking about here. So I don't really care about what the shear forces are, the bending moments. How does it actually affect my structure? G'day guys, my name is Bill, I'm the lead architect on this project. I'm just going to go through some of the key aspects that you've done with your current design and where we're currently sitting. So Brendan, let's kick it off. I'm the structural engineer on the project and I was looking at the plans of the architecture I was finding that the column spacing was quite far. So now what this does to the design means that those columns need to be quite big. It also increases the floor depth that you need and it may not fit in the floor to floor that you actually have in the building. But when I overlaid the plans, I saw there was a number of other internal walls that we may be able to get columns into. What this allows us to do is more evenly distribute the load through the structure. Well, Brandon, that's, that sounds great. So we've actually done some overlays. So it looks like we can get some additional columns in there. So should it have a big impact on the design? Another thing they've also done is overlaid some of those plans as well to see where we can get rid of some of those transfers. As this is one of the most costly elements inside the design. So if we can make sure we align those columns throughout the whole building, this will help you and the structural design overall. Where do I spend most of my time? Well, it's not really in those calculations. And you may be thinking it's all about the engineering design, sizing beams up, sizing structures up, working out how much flexural reinforcement needs to be put inside the design. This is not the case, and you may pick that up in the skit. It's about communication. There's a lot of communication back and forth with you and the architect about looking at where those elements need to be. Now, they don't necessarily care what the bending moment is, what the shear force moment is. They only care about what elements that you need to make sure that structure is stable. So most of your time is sit around those coordination meetings, going in and out of meetings, communicating back and forth with the architects. And while it's getting built as well, there'll be a lot of design changes. So there'll be a lot of written communication with the builder where they're making certain design changes that had certain problems. So writing back and forth with giving them instructions on what they need to do in both written and documented form. The actual engineering skill set is only a small aspect of what you'll be doing as a structural engineer. And you may have actually heard this in previous episodes. However, your most important skill is not your engineering ability, but your ability to communicate. 
See, everything we do as engineers is some form of communication, whether we're writing an email to a client, builder, or architect, whether we're giving some sort of advice during a meeting, so that verbal communication, or even our drawings, which is quite arguably one of our most important aspects as an engineer, is our documented drawings. They are a form of communication as well. So in trying to tell a story through those drawings about how the building is going to be put together, any key and critical areas that the builder needs to be concerned about. So what we actually produce as engineers, yes, there is some level of calculation and sizing it up to make sure a structure is stable and structurally sound, but most of it is in communicating that knowledge to a person that doesn't necessarily have the engineering ability that you have. Oh, what's the time? Oh, it's, pop. it's time to go home. Five o'clock already. Do some more work to do. So, how about the hours that we work? Most people will think it's a nine to five. Your office hours are nine to five. However, as an engineer, your hours will vary depending on what stages your projects are at and what aspects you need to consider. So my normal week is about somewhere between 40 to 50 hours, and that can peak at times. If we've got a project due, there's normally a deadline. Similar to when you're at university, you're cramming at those last second minutes to finish off your design. So this requires you to potentially do some additional overtime hours to complete the documentation that you need to issue to the client at a specific time. So if you do not maintain those critical requirements, it may even be related to side aspects. So not issuing a documentation or changes at a certain time can cause cost delays. So your hours, although they may be long in some companies and shorter in others, they potentially vary throughout the year, depending on what stages your projects are at. Depending on your company culture as well, this potentially vary. Some companies vie for that high number of work hours. Everyone's working overtime. Everyone's working really late. While other companies potentially try and shy away from that. So not only does it vary from time to time, depending on the projects, but also varies from company to company. As we're a service-based industry, we need to make sure we're maintaining the quality and timing aspects to our client, as we're only good as the previous project that we've given to them. So are there any other expectations versus realities that you've found in your engineering sector? Please comment below. And if you've made it to this point, don't forget to hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed at this point and you're interested in structural engineering, hit the subscribe button and to get all updates, you need to ding that bell. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.